100 FM, The Pike, uh, Worcester's Rock Station. Robert Palmer there, bad case of loving you. And in the studio, I have uh, the gentleman from right here in Worcester who uh, played guitar on that particular song and a few others on that album. Cliff Goodwin joins us this morning. Good, uh, good morning, you, Mike. Good morning. Thank you for coming in so early. I appreciate it. These aren't exactly musicians' hours. They unless aren't? you've been up all night already. But you're, you've, you're, you're well beyond that at this point, right? If you say so. <laughs> Well, that that's I mean that was one of Robert Palmer's biggest hits, and you you play guitar on that one, and and it, how did that come about? Well, I mean, it, it was the story was like you were already in a studio nearby, and yeah, that was done at uh, a studio in Nassau called Compass Point Studios. Oh yeah, was only, legendary. Yeah, that's where they did uh, Back in Black. Yeah, yeah, a lot of great albums. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, Stones. Yeah, uh, you yeah. Know, emotional. I, I, I don't know. In any event, um, yeah, we were down there making the second uh, American Standard album. And um, Robert sends down his road manager, this guy named Dave Harper, who was, I found out eventually he was Traffic's road manager. Oh, wow. Because I would have wanted to talk to him. <laughs> but it was very difficult to understand him because I'm, he came into my room and in the house we were standing, shaking me, and he just kept saying, Robert, Robert. Well, we eventually we figured out that he was saying, Robert wants you to play. <laughs> so... Don't, this is the truth. This is the weird world of rock and roll. And they, they, and dragged me, they dragged me back up to the studio. This was like late morning. And um, I said, what do you want me to do? And um, Robert Palmer says to me, uh, play. <laughs> See, that? that's, a, that's amazing to me because he, uh, he probably heard you. And yeah. he, just, he didn't want you to change. He didn't want to influence you in any way. No. Yeah, which I think is great. Well, you know, the, 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 the great thing about that is that's really the way it should be. If you like the people you play with, let them play. Yeah. It, it's, don't you don't trust be them. micromanaging. Well, I mean, the record was essentially done. It wasn't that we were starting from scratch. The record was essentially done. But Robert wanted something that he thought I could add to a few tracks on that record. And um, I had fun doing it. Yeah. You know? And I was already there. Right. Uh, with American Standard. That's another, uh, uh, like, a common story in the world of entertainment in general. Right place, right time. Oh. <laughs> right? I mean, you, you probably know better than, than most Absolutely. other people. Absolutely. Yeah. If you're not at the bus stop, you'll miss the bus. Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, you you, uh, you work with Robert Palmer. Uh, you work with Joe Cocker for 12, yeah, 12 yeah. years. Yeah. I think in the, uh, in the military, they called that a hitch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you started with him. With Joe Cocker, mid seventies into yeah, the eighties, yeah, mid late seventies right. to the late eighties, yeah. right? And seventy six to eighty eight, something like that. I mean, you know. And you played on some of his gigantic hits. I mean, you can leave your hat on. Were you on that one? Yeah, that's the, that's the Cocker album. We did that. Uh, Terry Manning, I think, produced that uh, most of that record down in uh, Arden Studios. I Again, mean, another I legendary st Arden Studios. I mean, yeah. some of the most amazing music was made at that place for years. Yeah, you know, it's so. Again, a lot of this stuff got by me. I found out later that Terry Manning produced uh, or worked on uh, Led Zeppelin three. Wow! You know, I found this out wow. after the fact. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, talk about being at the bus stop. I was at right. the wrong bus stop. I missed a few. <laughs> <laughs> and then you also uh, for Joe Cocker, did you play on When the Night Comes? Or no, what, no, what no. Was that the, was what was the other giant hit? Was it like a Jennifer Warren song? Oh, up where we belong. Yeah, did you play on that? Uh, yeah, that we yeah, cut. Yeah, huge we, hit. We cut a few. Uh, you know, it's it's a funny story about that. Joe used to a lot of the demos um, used to come through me to Joe because uh, people w would send everything. You know, because Joe didn't write his songs, so he was picking material. And uh, he used to call us in the middle of the night, like two or three in the morning. The phone would ring. My wife Sue Ann would answer the phone. She'd say before she answered it, she'd say, it "Must be Joe." <laughs> so he'd pass the phone over to me, and I'd say, uh, hello, and he'd go, Cliff? <laughs> like, I'm thinking, you called me. You, know, who, you call me, Joe. <laughs> you know? But we talk, about, we talk about recipes a lot because we liked Indian food. But concern, considering, um, and concerning Up Where We Belong, I like to tell the story because it shows you I know how to pick them. Um, he, we finally got around to Up Where We Belong, and uh, so what do you think of that song? I said, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> wow. He said, he said, what do you mean? I said, no. Nah. It, it's just somebody wanting, it's somebody wanting to. Uh, you have the you golden know, ear, my yeah, friend. Yeah, don't you know it? And somebody wanting to, uh, 
ram another you are so beautiful down your throat because the, right. the arrangement was fairly similar it was like a what a rubato that's a musical yeah. term ladies and gentlemen <laughs> um a, a piano opening and then the song comes in and uh he said what do you think of i said i wouldn't do it and it was <laughs> i remember vividly joe says to me he goes i don't know cliff i think there's something there <laughs> yeah he had and, the uh, golden ear. yeah he yeah. he really he really did yeah uh, that that was a it, there's a son, funny story that goes with that that was song was written by Will Jennings, Buffy St. Marie, and Jack Nitchie. And Jack, oh, Jack Nitchie, who Jack Nitchie worked a lot was, with Neil Young. He and, was, yeah, yeah, he was having, getting a divorce from Buffy St. Marie, and that song was in the divorce settlement. And it, from oh. what Will Jennings told me, <laughs> Will Jennings didn't, in court, the judge said, so Jack, what, did Buffy contribute to this song? And Jack goes, well, not much. And the judge goes, well, what did she contribute? And Jack goes, the chorus. <laughs> Oh, not much. <laughs> you know, yeah, it was just the part those, everybody remembers. Yeah, this is what right? Will Jennings to, told me was kind of funny. At but we we cut that that we cut that a couple couple times. That was brought to Joe by a guy named a producer named Stuart Levine, who who at the time was uh, he came by. He said, "This I want you to listen to this this guy I'm working with. I think he's going to be great." And I said, "Who is he?" Because well, his name is Mick, but we call him simply Red. And um, Mick oh, Hucknell. Mick Hucknell Mick from Hucknell. Simply Red. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. And I, and I, I, you know, it was one of those times again when you go, well, okay, you can pick them too, you know? Yeah, really? Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, that, that, that Cocker album was a, was a full record, and I think Capitol only took half of it. There was, you know, back then, it was the real fun record business. Like, right. Uh, around the same time, Joe... Next record was uh, an album called Sheffield Steel, and that was on Island, and it was produced by Chris Blackwell, who owned Island Records. Right, and he he's like signed Bob Marley and U2. Right, yeah. and at the same time, Up Where We Belong comes out, and Chris would not add it to the record. Really? Because it a... he said it changed the vibe of, of the concept wow. of, it, of the album he was thinking. And so there was this real strange, not discussion, but, you know, dichotomy. They can't try to come up with all kinds of things where, you know, throat put the single yeah. in with the packaging of the album, or, you know, all that stuff. Chris wouldn't do it. Well, uh, we, we mentioned, you mentioned some legendary studios earlier, Compass Point, uh, Arden Studios in Memphis. You, uh, uh, just in the past couple of years, recorded a new album called Double It Up with a lot of your friends who are also notable musicians, but you went to Abbey Road Studio. Yeah. I mean, this place is more than a studio. It's, it's mythical. So I wanted to ask... Like, how do you get time at Abbey Road? Do you just send an email saying, hey, I'd like to record some stuff like any other studio? Or do you got to know a guy to know a guy that knows a guy that knows Paul McCartney or something like that? Well, the executive producer of uh, Double It Up was a guy by the name of uh, Peach Nealon. Uh, his real name is Rich, but we know him as Peach. He was one of the, he was the original sound man for American Standard uh, back in in. The 70s. That's you know? a band you were in here in Worcester, yeah, right? In American the 70s. Standard band. Right. Um, and uh, he had already kind of had a relationship with Abbey Road in that he knew how to get a hold of the right people to tell okay. him what was going on. It's It wasn't as exclusive a situation as you would think, but they still wanted to know who was coming. Of course, yeah. And of course, uh, once he let them know who was coming, uh, the answer was yes. Yeah, because like these guys could really play. Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty much. That's they won't know, be his, wasting his, our time. Provenance, if you will. Yeah, you know. Uh, but uh, you're right. I mean, you hit the nail right on the head. It's not only a incredibly high functioning studio; it is a shrine. It is, and it's you amazing. can't, you cannot remove. You know, when I'm doing vocals. Yeah. I cannot remove the spirit of John Lennon on my right, right shoulder. He's because oh. we did it in studio two. There's three studios there. One is a gigantic one that where they do all the like the Star Wars soundtracks, you know, mm -hmm. John oh, set, the sets up the orchestra. Yeah. Yes, hundred and twenty right. piece. And then studio two is where the Beatles did most of their stuff. And that's where we recorded. Wow. You know, it, it's noteworthy by virtue of the fact there's a stairway that goes up from the studio up to the control room. And so that's studio two. And then three is, is a little bit newer and a little bit smaller. Right. But, oh, yeah. I mean, and, and again, we have all been, you know, like I was telling you a story earlier off, off mic about 
uh, a Joe Crocker record we did at Criteria Studios. Again, which was in legendary. Miami. L- I mean, uh, uh, Allman Brothers. Derek Eric and the Dominoes. Right, Derek and the Dominoes. Yeah. Oh I mean, my Mitch God, played right? the piano, that picked yeah. the Layla piano. You know? Right. Did you work with Tom Dowd when you were down there? No. Okay. That was, right. uh, like I said, that was uh, for Island. That was. Sorry, no, that we're was ner- I'm nerding out on music here, folks. I'm sorry. Tom Dowd produced Eric Clapton and the Allman Brothers. Yeah, he, but yeah. he, Tom Dowd was really a staff guy for Atlantic. Um, that luxury can afford was on Electra Asylum. I know everybody's at home going, what is he talking about? <laughs> These are this? called record labels. They used to be a big deal back in the day. Back in the day, they yeah. were actually people that's, right. that sold your record for you. Right. They were called record yeah. companies. Right, right. <laughs> well, um, so it must have been an amazing thrill for you because I've read in, in more than one interview with you that it was that Beatles Ed Sullivan appearance in 1964 that kind of inspired you to, to start a band like so many millions of other people around the world. So it must have been a thrill to go back to where they actually recorded that music. Well, it was more. It was really more than a more than a thrill. You, again, I said you can't you can't leave the spirit, right? If you will, you know. But you're right, Mike. Again, in 1964, I was, uh, you know, what 11, 12 years old. <laughs> um, you know I, what the stat the, the stat is. I think the Beatles on it sold on February eighth or 9th, nineteen sixty four. On February 7th, there were 5,000 bands in America. Right. On February 10th, there were 50,000 <laughs> right, bands. Yeah, right, yeah, exactly. You yeah. know, every, everybody <laughs> decided they wanted to do things. Yeah. But that's just one aspect of it. I mean, it doing, you know, my first band um, was people that wanted to do it. We didn't necessarily know how to play. Right. I mean, our first set list was was really cool. We had like 30 songs, but only five of them we knew. The other 25 were songs we liked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> But we started playing early. Yeah. You know, it was kind of novel back then to uh, have a band. Yeah, it wasn't like a big. It wasn't a huge, huge business yet. It, was, uh, no, it wasn't it, like it, a. Yeah, it wasn't a common thing to like. Oh yeah, I played in a band. Everybody it, can say that. Yeah. But back then, that was not something you pursued. No. Well, yeah. it was kind of a. You know, again, it's a. It's a. It's a passion that is a double-edged sword. It's a. It's a blessing and a curse. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's a passion that you. You. It's a blessing. You really want to do it and you love it. It's a curse that you have to do it and you love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You can't. You got to get it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, on double, you mentioned like you played the, like there was only like three songs you liked, you know. But here on double it up, you you carefully chose some songs that you really you and the guys that you play with really loved here. I mean, it's a great collection of tunes on here. We had a lot of fun. We cut live, right? Uh, which uh, is the really the way you should do it because exactly. how can you yeah. have a conversation when there's no one speaking back? Right. Did you use auto tune, Cliff? <laughs> um, <laughs> what? You... The last time I think I tuned up was 1984. <laughs> uh, uh, did we? No, I don't think we. <laughs> well, you know, so it's funny you, you say that. Sometimes perfection is in the warts, yes. if you will. You know, the magic, the magic of a classic recording that we all love. Right has some imperfections yeah and that's what makes gives them their identity exactly and yeah. it also it makes it real yeah which is really what we're talking about here yes you know the, the reality of the moment is incredibly valuable yeah especially in this day and age yeah if you can capture that moment too especially at a place like abbey road i mean you, that's that's magic well again it it's not only a shrine but it's a high functioning studio yeah. so you don't, uh, you don't have to worry other than what you have yeah, to Yeah, you just have to worry about playing and the yeah. music, and that's, that's awesome. Well, uh, you guys, you can see, uh, who else is in the band? Uh, Mitch Shakur. Right, uh, My another brother legend. from Another Mother. Right, another We've legend. We've been together since junior high school, essentially. Uh-huh. Um, Derek Dyer. Oh, right. Who was in American Standard and, and uh, played with us with Joe, and also he played with Tina. Yeah. Did um, you ever, real quick, did you ever cross paths with Tina Turner? Sure. We yeah. did a whole bunch of d- dates uh, tour in, uh, in Europe because Joe was very, very popular in, in Europe in the 80s, and Tina was essentially coming back. Right, yeah. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah, there was a lot of, a lot of cross-pollination, so yeah. to speak. And on bass, we have Wolf Janandes, who's just a classic, absolute, stellar bass player. And then the great Marty Richards on drums, who we haven't got enough time for me to tell you who he's played <laughs> I with. I know he's played with 
Joe Perry, right? Joe Perry, Jay Giles. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it, yeah, he's it, one another guy that's just. Oh, Marty is yeah. uh, he's he's one of those magical drummers that has this incredible jazz sensitivity, but he doesn't look at rock with contempt. Right, and yeah. that's a very rare combination. Yeah. You know, only the greats had it. Bonham, Ginger Baker, right. Charlie, Charlie, Charlie Watts. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, yeah. they 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 had that that jazz sensitivity, but they didn't look at rock with at the tip. You know, yeah, it was with, caveman. Uh, music. Exactly, right? Yeah. yeah. And then um, the uh, other the singer that we brought in was a uh, uh, lady by the name of Annie um, Lang Nicholson who uh, we found, she sang with us with Joe many years ago. We found her singing with Leon Russell. Wow. Um, and uh, Annie uh, eventually married uh, Michael Lang, who... Uh, oh, the guy the, who the started Woodstock. Woodstock. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of, these are all, we're all old old right. friends. and A lot know, of miles. Yeah. And also, you know, everybody knows that they the other guy has their back. Right. So to me, it's just, it was, a, it was an absolute... Uh, dream. <laughs> yeah, sir, it sounds like a dream. Your oh, whole yeah. your whole career though has been has been kind of you've had you've done some pretty amazing stuff with some amazing people. I've been very very lucky. I'm yeah. totally blessed to play with you know my best friends. Like I said earlier, you know if you're at the bus stop when the bus comes by, yeah, you know, jump on, uh, jump on. If <laughs> if you if the bus doesn't come by, you're still at the bus stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, Cliff, I appreciate you coming in early and, and telling us about oh, my uh, pleasure. You know, your career and making the new album, Double It Up. In fact, why don't we get to it? Let's play some music here. We'll do the title track. Thank you. From, uh, from Double It Up here, it's 100 FM The Pike. Cliff Goodwin, thank you very much. I appreciate it.